John chapter 18 begins with Christ in the garden, and it begins his crucifixion journey. As we studied these lessons, I pulled out different aspects of Christ's ministry and how that can apply to us. Different lessons that we learn that Christ teaches us, that the Holy Spirit teaches us, and how we can apply it into our lives, right? That's what Sunday school is all about, is learning and applying it to our lives. As we get into this last portion of John, we see Christ is going down the crucifixion path, and I was wondering how we were going to try to apply that to our lives, because none of us are sinless, none of us died for the sins of the world, none of us are even going to have an opportunity to do the same things that Christ did here in the last couple chapters of John. So I really just prayed and asked the Lord to show me what he wanted me to pull out of these last couple chapters. Not that there's not anything there to learn, but just how can we apply it to our lives today? Here in John chapter 18, we see four interactions with different groups of people. And what we're going to learn today is Not to be able to do the same things that Christ did, but to handle the interactions that Christ had with these four different groups of people. He had four different interactions, and though we cannot travel the same path that Christ did, we can handle these interactions that he had in the same way that he did. We may not be able to travel the same path that he did, but we can still handle it in the same way that he did. We see a first interaction in John chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. He has an interaction with Judas and a band of men. We're going to read the first five verses of John chapter 18. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Sidron, where there was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. First interaction we have is Judas comes with a band of men that's given to him to be able to bring Jesus into captivity. Jesus knew, Jesus, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. Jesus knew that he was going to be taken away, that he was going to be crucified. Jesus did not run and hide. In fact, quite the opposite. He went to a place that Judas knew he was going to be. It says there in Scripture that Jesus often went there with his disciples. Maybe it was a quiet place, safe place, maybe a place that not a lot of people visited. When Jesus wanted to kind of get away from the crowd and maybe he wanted to spend some time teaching his disciples, praying with the disciples, maybe he went there by himself many times. Judas knew he was going to be there. Jesus didn't run and hide from what he knew what was going to happen. As Christians following the Lord's leading, showing the love of Christ, being light in the darkness, we're going to find ourselves in situations where people are going to ask us questions. If you work secularly, or even if you don't work secularly, if you work in ministry full-time, you're going to have people ask you questions. Questions like, why do you dress the way that you dress? Why do you talk the way that you talk? Why do you not drink or not smoke? Or why do you go to church? Or why do you give tithes? Why do you give 10% of what you make? You know, how how do you even make it off of that? Like, I could barely make it off of 100%. I could barely make it off 150%, much less you give 10% of what you make to the Lord, plus offerings and missions. And it seems like it's a waste of money to them. People are going to ask questions, and sometimes they're going to ask questions not in a nice way, like, oh, hey, can you tell me about God? No, they're going to attack you. Say, man, like, you know, you, why don't you drink? Like, what, what are you, a sissy? You don't smoke? Like, you know, here, have something to drink. Jesus Christ was not ashamed and not afraid of what was going to happen. He could have completely avoided the situation, but he didn't. He knew that Judas was coming. He was in a place where Judas was going to find him. And as Christians, we're going to have confrontation. 
But just as Christ, in this first interaction, he was not ashamed of who he was. He said, they came looking for Jesus of Nazareth. They said, who are you looking for? That's what Jesus asked them. Well, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. He didn't skirt around it. He's like, oh, I saw him. He just went down the road over there and misdirected him. No, he said, I, I'm he. I'm Jesus. When we're confronted with, who are you? Well, I'm Kurt Rogers. I'm the assistant pastor at Roger City Baptist Church. Or where do you go to church? Well, I go to church at Roger City Baptist Church. Don't be ashamed of who you are, the things that you believe in, Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. I, I remember as a teen boy, uh, Pastor and I, we worked at Kanabi's Apple Farm, picking up apples. And uh, we had a nickname there. We were the Baptist Boys. That's what Doc Kanabi's uh, son, he called us the Baptist Boys. And you know what? That didn't really bother me because I'm like, okay, I'm... A Baptist, like there's, I'm not ashamed of that at all. And I remember my dad, every time he'd go to drop us off, he would ask us this question. I don't know if, if Pastor remembers this or not, but my dad would ask us, he would say, are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? That's what he asked, and, and every time, we'd, no, Dad, we're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. That's all he would say, he'd just say, are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? No, I'm not, no, I'm not. Many years later, that's, it still resonates in my head when you go out to the gas station, to the grocery store, when I worked secularly in the field, are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? When somebody asks you about your faith, when somebody asks you about your church or something about Christianity, do you skirt around the answer? Or are you say, hey, you know what? I am a believer in Jesus Christ. This is who I am. This is part of who I am. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? Romans 1.16, it says... For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus was not ashamed of who he was, what he was, what's going to happen to him. The, there was no consequence that he was going to not be willing to take. Whatever they were going to do, he was going to accept whatever was going to happen. He's not ashamed of who he was. That's our first interaction that we're looking at. That can apply to us. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? Next, we see Peter and Malchus. So, John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. Then Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? We have a little more um, context to this account, this interaction in the book of Matthew chapter 26. Let's flip there. We're, we're going to stay there just for a second. Matthew chapter 26. Same occurrence, different account. Matthew records it. Matthew 26, 51 through 54. I'll give you a second to get there. If not, I'm going to read it. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand. Notice Matthew didn't name any names, but uh, John, he's like, yeah, it was Peter. Peter. Peter pulled out the sword. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But now then shall the scriptures be but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? That thus it must be. Jesus tells Peter three things here in this situation. Peter is zealous for the Lord. Peter is not about to let any group of people come and take our Lord and Savior from them by force, against his will. So he draws out his sword and he takes a swing at the servant. Now there's dispute whether the Peter was this bad with the sword that he couldn't just lop his head off, that he missed and cut his ear off, or that he was very good with the sword and he purposely meant to just swipe his ear off. Either way, maybe it was one of those things where Peter always had a sword on him and, and the disciples were like, Peter, like, put that sword away before you cut somebody's ear off. Like, just, just chill. Like, we got Jesus. It's fine. Well, Peter's got his sword and Peter's going to fight this band of men because he's not going to let you know, Jesus be taken away. Was that a wrong desire of Peter to fight? No, it's 
I don't think it was. He didn't mean any, I mean, he did mean harm to the soldiers and to the servants. But he didn't mean anything malicious against anybody. He just wanted to stand up for Christ. Nobody was about to take the Savior without a fight. That was his reaction. Okay, Jesus tells Peter three things in Matthew chapter 26, this account. He tells Peter three things that apply to us in this interaction. The first thing that he tells Peter is, when you react in a harsh manner, that is the response that you're going to get. Peter reacts with the sword, and he tells Peter, if you, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. If you, if you fight fire with fire, guess what's, what's going to happen? Everything's going to burn, and it's going to burn faster. Whether you're raising children, teaching a Sunday school class, teaching master clubs, dealing with a family, dealing with co-workers, dealing with employees, dealing with a boss. If you lash out in anger, guess what response you're going to get? Anger. If you lash out with sharp words, guess what response you're going to get? Sharp words. Here Christ tells Peter, don't lash out in anger. Don't live by the sword. Because that's the exact response that you're going to get. The next thing that Jesus tells Peter is, and this is going to sound a little bit different, but Jesus tells Peter that he doesn't need to defend Jesus. Jesus does not need you to defend him. Let me preface in saying that I'm not saying don't stand up for what's right. Don't stand up for Jesus Christ, because we just talked about not being ashamed of Jesus Christ. But Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you don't think that I have the power to ask God to send 12 legions of angels? He could send just one angel and it could have taken care of that whole band of men. P Jesus did not need Peter to fight these men. Jesus had all the power in the world to do that. How it applies to us is God's word, God, the church, Jesus, does not need you to fight for him. He gives us his word. He gives us the Holy Spirit. What the soldiers were doing, was it wrong? Yes, it was wrong. It was maybe the most wrong thing. They were getting ready to kill Jesus, crucify Jesus. Jesus tells them, Peter, I don't need you to fight for me. Okay? I don't need you to levy judgment on these people. God doesn't need you to levy judgment on the sinner. God doesn't need you to levy judgment on whoever. Is it a wrong situation? Absolutely. You know, sh should we be bold and should we stand up for what's right? Absolutely. But we are not the judge. When pastor preaches, pastor is not the judge. Pastor shares God's word. He's not as far as I know, he's not going through the list of our church members like, oh, I wonder who's messed up this week so I can orchestrate a message so I can get them. No. He opens up God's word and he shares what the Lord has for him. And if it happens to be for you, then it's for you. But we are not the judge. Judge not that you be not judged, right? For with what matter that we judge, we shall also be judged. Jesus doesn't need you to fight for him. We should stand up for him, but we don't need to fight God's battles. The last thing that he tells Peter in verse number 54, he says, How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? Peter tries to change somebody else. He tries to react to a wrong situation. How is God's word going to be furthered? How is the things that God has in works, how is that going to be furthered when in our own strength we try to intercept you know, a wrong situation or, or levy judgment on somebody or fight against somebody physically? How is God's word going to be furthered? How is God's will going to be furthered? If we teach and preach the love of Christ, if we teach and preach that we should love our enemies, if we teach and preach that we should love as Christ loved, then somebody says something dumb and we lash out. That's that, that's, how's that going to further God's word? And, and that's what Jesus tells Peter. How is the scriptures going to be fulfilled? If you kill all the Romans and I don't get crucified, how is the scripture going to be fulfilled there? We understand that that's not what happened and that's not even the realm of possibility. But that's what Jesus tells Peter. How are the scriptures going to be fulfilled if you in your power, your strength, try to do something? Was it wrong, Peter, trying to physically stop them from taking Jesus? No, it wasn't necessarily wrong. But that's not what God's plan was. That's not what God's will was. That's what he tells Peter. Peter, how are the scriptures going to be fulfilled if you do what you think is right? Those are three things we can learn from that interaction. When we react in a harsh manner, that's going to be our response. 
Jesus does not need you to defend him. And how is God's will and God's word going to be furthered if we lash out in anger? Jesus, um, just as Jesus had things that he needed to complete that his father had him to do, we have things that we need to complete in our lives that the Father has for us to do. And if we vary from that path and we do things in our own strength and try to fix the problems ourselves using God's word to beat somebody over the head with, share, here, Brother Joe, you can't do this because the Bible says this and this and this. We're not going to be able to complete the things that God has for us if we're worried about everybody else loving judgment on them. Let God take care of that. Next, interaction number three. We see the high priest and Christ's doctrine. That's our next interaction. It's the high priest and Christ's doctrine. John chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. John chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. They take Jesus to the high priest. This is a, uh, an interaction with them. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret I have said nothing. Why askest, why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What have I said unto them? Behold, they know what I have said. When asked about his doctrine, Jesus did not argue. He did not have to explain where he stood. He did not have to explain what he believed and why he believed it. Jesus always did what the Father asked him to do, and he was always open about his doctrine, about what he believed, about what the Father asked him to do. And he said, I never said anything in secret. Everything that I said was open, and ask them. They know what I said. As Christians, we don't have to decide what our doctrine is, and we don't have, people don't have to question, well, you know, why do you have this standard, or why do you believe this? Our answer isn't, well, this is what I believe. No, no. We don't have to decide what our doctrine is because we have our doctrine here. So when somebody asks you, what is your stance on abortion? Well, I don't have a stance on abortion, but God's word, this is what God's word says about it. Oh, well, what, what does the Baptist church say about music? Well, the Baptist church doesn't say, this is what God's word says about it. What is, whatever it is, Jesus didn't have to argue or explain to the high priest. He didn't even give them any definite answers because his whole life was open, public. He taught, he preached. They knew what he... They're asking questions that they know the answers to already. They just want to trip Jesus up. The world, most of the times, they don't necessarily care what your answer is unless they are God's working in them and they are seeking God and you can share the gospel with them and you can tell when somebody's genuinely asking but most of the time people aren't asking because they're trying to trip you up they're trying to get in an argument with you answer not a fool his folly right our doct our doctrine is not our doctrine it's what God's word says and we can be confident in God's word we don't have to argue with anybody we open up God's word and share it with them. And that Christ didn't argue with Pilate. He didn't argue with the high priest. He didn't argue with anybody in this whole trial process. He said, I already told you. I do the things that my father asked me to do. I say the things that he asked me to say. It, that's, that's, that's his doctrine, is, is God's word. Last interaction that we see is uh, John 18, 33 and 38. We see Jesus has his interaction with Pilate. John 18, verse number 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it to thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What, what hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom, um, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Verse number 38, this question is being asked 
today, now, the last two years, I think, is this question. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? When we're being questioned, when we're being wrongly treated, when we're put in wrong situations, when we're confronted, this interaction that Jesus has with Pilate, there's two things that we have to remember. One, we are not of this kingdom. We are different. We are aliens. We are not being targeted specifically because we're Christians and the whole world's out against us. And maybe in some cases, sure. But you don't want to know why? Because we're different. We're a peculiar people. 1 Peter 2.8, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We stand out like a sore thumb. The way we dress, the way we talk, the way that we act, we're different. We have to remember when we're dealing with lost people, when, even when we're dealing with other Christians or baby Christians or people that claim to be Christians, we are not of this kingdom. And that's what Jesus tells Pilate. We're not of this kingdom. I have a different kingdom. If, I was, if this was my kingdom, I would have people fighting for me and I would be encouraging people to fight for me. But not. This is not my kingdom. My kingdom that I'm setting up is in heaven. We are not of this world. This is not our kingdom. Our kingdom is being set up. So when we have interactions with people, let's not get angry at them because they don't understand. Because you know what? They don't understand. They can't understand. They're in darkness. And we are in light. That's why it's important to share the gospel with them. To share God's love and God's light to them. So that they can understand. But they, they're never going to fully understand because they are lost. We are not of this kingdom, but also we have one purpose on earth. And that's what Jesus tells him. Um, I'm going to read verse number 37 again. Thou sayest that I am king. To this end was I born. Jesus tells Pilate, this is why I was born. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Sometimes we wonder why after we're saved, why don't we just get raptured instantly up into heaven? Once we're saved, we don't have to deal with any, any problems. We don't have to deal with anybody. We trust Christ for salvation. Why after we get saved, why don't we just go right up to heaven? The reason why that we don't is this exact reason why Jesus said, this is why I was born. This is why I had to come into the world, that I could bear witness unto the truth. The only light that this lost world can ever see is us, God's word. Jesus working through us. If we got raptured right into heaven after we got saved, then we would never be able to share the light. That question that Pilate asks, what is truth? In a day and age of misinformation, lies, deceptions, trickery, sin, only one thing has remained constant, and that is truth, right? Truth is not based off of feelings. Truth is not based off of what you decide truth is. Truth is based off of one thing. So what is truth? John chapter 14, verse number 6. Let's go there. John chapter 14, verse number 6. I'll read it. Jesus saith unto, unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What is truth? Jesus. God, God's word. That's what truth is. John chapter 8, verse number 32. I'll just turn there and read it. If you would like to, you can. John chapter 8, verse number 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus is truth. Jesus equals truth. If you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. What, what's gonna, the truth going to make you free from? It's going to make you free from sin, free from death, free from separation from the Father, going through uh, understanding salvation um, with the teenagers. There's two deaths, right? There's earthly death, and then there's death and hell cast into the lake of fire. Death means separation. When we die, our soul is separated from our body. When we die a second time, if we were to die a second time, that's separation from God. What are we free from? We're free from separation from the Father. The truth makes us free. 
Jesus Christ makes us free from sin, from death, from separation from the Father, from the law, from Satan. We're free indeed. This is how Christ handled these four interactions. Interactions with people, lost people, people that meant harm against him, some people that maybe they didn't understand fully who Jesus was, like Pilate. And he had to question Jesus. When we get questioned, when we deal with people that mean harm against us, or maybe people that are just, they don't know, they're lost, they don't know. When we deal with these people, these are four different ways in which we can handle these situations. We're not going to be able to walk the same path Christ walked here in John chapter 18, but we can handle these interactions the same way in which Jesus handled these interactions. Just as Jesus handled these um, situations in a correct way, it doesn't mean that the problems go away, but it allows us to complete what the Father asked us to do and to glorify God and reach others.